hi, i'm stephanie townsend ayala, elder law attorney and your video host for the el paso elder care channel today we're joined by grace ortiz who is a community initiative specialist for adult protective services of texas. thank you so much for joining me today grace. oh no, thank you for the invite. i want to thank you first for all of your hard work in our community helping to protect the elderly and those who are incapacitated from exploitation and abuse. i know you've committed your life to that here in el paso. i actually have. Um, i'm going to tell you i have a great passion for it. Um, I was an investigator for five and a half years and I've got to see some horrific things happening in our community, which I couldn't believe, but now that I got involved, it's time to make a difference. How can we make a difference as the average citizen? I know that our people watching this want to know, what could I do? I mean, it's a horrible situation, but what in the world can I do? I can't change anything. I'm just one person. Actually, we all can make a difference and we can make a change in our community. First of all, get to know the programs in your community. One of them is Adult Protective Services. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know about the agency, don't know about the program. And they don't even know there's a law that requires reporting. Actually, Texas is a mandated state. Good. And it states that if we suspect at any time any type of abuse, neglect, or exploitation going on in our community, we are supposed to report at 1-800-252-5400, which is our hotline. Once that report is received here, we'll start working on it and seeing what's really happening in that home. And and when somebody, what happens when somebody picks up the phone and calls that 1-800-252-5400? And, and what exactly, let's say I'm a neighbor of an elderly person and I see some people coming and going and, and maybe some unusual activity going on, but I don't really know if something bad is happening, what should I do? If you suspect something, and try to get as much information as you can, if you suspect something, call that 1-800 number, and then give them as much information as you can. If they feel, because they're gonna screen it, of course, if mm -hmm. they see that there is enough information for us to take that report, the investigator will be out there to start investigating and see what we can do to protect that elder. Well, what about the people who don't wanna get involved? They don't want, what if they make a report and then they find out that it wasn't really something bad and their neighbor hates them? So, I mean, I think a lot of people go through that thought process and don't call because of that. Actually, there's a lot of people who say, you know what, I'd rather not, I don't wanna get involved, it's none of my business. But our motto is, it's everyone's business. It's we, everyone's it's business. It's everyone's business. So actually, if you're really fearful of retaliation or, or causing any problems with your neighbors, it can be anonymous. You don't have to identify yourself. So you, when, when somebody calls APS, uh, the, ano the, the, the call is anonymous. The person who calls is anonymous, and that name is kept anonymous. Is that correct? Yes, and actually, if at that time you decide to give your information, we protect the reporter. We are not allowed to say who reported, why we got the case, um, and how we got the case. So in actuality, we are there also to protect the reporter. Okay, so the people who call are kept, um, that is an anonymous call, you are not required to give your name, but if you do give your name, you as an agency will not give it to the people who are suspected uh, perpetrators. Actually, you're absolutely right. Even if I go to court, and we're in the middle of a court proceeding and the judge all of a sudden feels he needs to know or she needs to know who reported, um, we will stop the court proceeding because we don't want it to be part of the court record and we'll let the judge know in his chambers who reported if that's really important or relevant to the case. So, so an anonymity is super important. What are the other reasons that you hear from people why they don't report suspected abuse, neglect, or expo exploitation? One is they don't want to get involved. That, that's the top. Number two is they're not sure what to do and how to go about it. And the third one is usually when they do report, it's too late. The neglect, um, the medical neglect, the abuse is so severe that that individual really, really doesn't make it most of the time. Hmm. So, so a lack of reporting could really um, to le lead to a real severity of situations. Now, how do you, um, what do you have to say to somebody out there who's listening and watching right now and knows of somebody that they really they worry about but they don't know. Actually, reporting can save a life. It really, really can. Um, I was an investigator and a lot of times when I did get that case, that individual had been in medical neglect or physical neglect for so long that by the time I got involved, they were so ill or so you know uncared for that whatever I did was not enough. And maybe I gave them one to two months of living with a little bit of respect and dignity. So one day you and I are gonna be elderly and I wanna know that there's a voice out there for me, that there's someone looking out for me because actually they are the forgotten. 
people have the stigma, they're gonna pass away anyway. So what, why do I have to? Because one day you and I are gonna be there. Those individuals are gonna be there. So don't you think that we should make a difference and have that voice for them and report if something's going on? You're right, how about the golden rule? Uh, do as you would like others to do for you. I would certainly want somebody to report if they were uh, worried about me, were I in a situation where I couldn't take care of myself anymore? Oh yeah. And so, what do you? Um, how many El Pasoans are, are in danger right now? Do you know how? Um, do you have statistics on that? Actually, we we're very underreported. That's mm -hmm. why I am very much into talking to the community, reminding them that there is an agency that can help. Um, last year, maybe we got 14. Well, currently, about 1,400 cases that have been reported. That's not enough. It really isn't. Just 1,400 reports from El Paso? Right now, so far. Um, and we're hoping that more people will report. That's the first thing. And the sad part is is that there's 10,000 people reaching age 65 right now. A day. Per day? Per day. So you can imagine the baby boomers, they're hitting 65. That's an elder. So again, it's the community getting involved, knowing what to do, who's out there, how we can help. The stigma is APS is there to take them out of the home and put them in a nursing home. No, we're not. No, mm -hmm. we're not. We just want to help, give them a little bit of dignity, a little bit of respect, let them live in their home, just like you and I would want to live in our home, and, and have a wonderful and safe life. You're absolutely right. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, um, I don't want to call APS, I don't want to get involved, because then they're going to take over my loved one's wife. life. The government will take over their life. They say things like that. People are so afraid that if they call you that the government will take over your life. <laughs> and, and I try to tell people, no, 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 APS is your friend. APS helps you. APS can help us get through this. In fact, APS is the only agency that has the power and authority to help. There's the also, also thing, well, if somebody wants to be stupid and, and let themselves be taken advantage of, then that's their business. Why should I get involved? There you go, that attitude again. <laughs> you know, and they say, well, and then I stop and think, maybe dementia is already setting in. Because sometimes, I've, I've read statistics that people with dementia, sometimes they're not diagnosed until 10 years after the onset of, of, the, um, of the dementia. So, so they might be in dementia, but appear to be okay and have moments of lucidity where they appear to be totally in control. But if you spent more time, you'd realize that they keep saying the same lucid sounding sentence over and over and over again. And this is why a lot of times I tell children, if you have parents, yeah, we get so busy, we have busy lives, you know, we're just out there trying to do our, our family thing, our jobs, and we put our parents by the wayside. It's so important to keep an eye on them. Just keep an eye on them. Make sure they're okay. If you see a little change, Let's go in and see what's really going on. It might be something as minor as a urinary tract infection that's mm -hmm. causing the confusion. There doesn't have to be somebody doing something nefarious to call APS, in other words. Somebody could just be at home and neglecting themselves, you know, and not taking care of themselves. That is the number one, number one cases of neglect. Now, I'll, I'll tell you why. We get older. We're no longer get to get to the bathroom on time. That's depressing. Mm -hmm. We can't cook for ourselves because we're having a hard time with our hands, our arthritis. We're afraid of burning ourselves, so we're not eating as well. We forget to take our medication. Right. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about this topic when we come back. We're speaking now on the El Paso Elder Care Channel with Grace Ortiz, and we'll be right back. And we are back with Grace Ortiz, Community in Integration Specialist with the uh, Adult Protective Services of Texas. Thank you so much, Grace. We were talking about self-neglect before the break, and that's a huge part of it. And what about exploitation? Are you able, without naming names, can you share with us um, a story of exploitation so that we can understand how, how do you work? You don't come in and take over people's lives when we call you? No, not at all. In fact, if we get a case on exploitation, we try to get all our evidence together. Everything's evidence-driven, especially exploitation. So we have to request lots of information. But I'm going to tell you one about one case that stands out in particular in my head. Um, there was a gentleman, well off, no family, no wife, lived at one of our assisted livings. When you live in one of our assisted livings, that means you got some good money coming in. Sure, good and income at good least. Good income. And um, he ever, what do the elderly do? They love a routine. They, do, they are, they're all about routines. And so 
pretty much every day he would go to one of our local restaurants and have breakfast. So he befriends three of the young waitresses there. And so they start visiting him at the assisted living. They start calling him grandpa, dad. Really, really, there's that trust and relationship, which is key. That little bit of attention that the elderly want, he mm -hmm. got. And so all of a sudden, eight months later, he can't live there anymore. What happened? Huge change. And you could see he was devastated. There was something going on. He did not take it well that he was having to move out. These young ladies were helping him move out. And so our, there was a report received, and we started looking into it. Within eight months, $278,000 were gone from his account. Uh, a lot of fancy meals, purses, shopping that went towards these young ladies. And so, you know, a lot of times people think, well, he wanted to do it. Did well, they really, gave him attention. Yeah. Did he really want to do it? Was that what it was? And now he has no money. He couldn't live where he was so used to living. Um, unfortunately, when we do get involved, we did do some type of psychiatric evaluation, and it did come out that he was not able to make decisions. We don't know if the shock of the situation caused him to have some type, type of mini stroke or something where he couldn't decide anymore, but it was so sad. So we sad. Were you able to get any of the money back? Of course not. Oh, it's gone. You know how hard that is? Um, because they were spent on things, and when we were at court, these young girls did show up. And then I, I just couldn't believe that they showed up wanting to find out what was going to happen with him. But they knew what they did. They took all his money and advantage of him. So a lot of times this is why I tell people, you know, you're not being nosy. But if all of a sudden your grandma and grandpa can't pay their bills, their utilities are being cut off, they can't pay for their meds, somebody needs to look in to see what's going on. What happened? Why can't they all of a sudden meet their, their expenses? You know what? There's a common thread I've noticed in my practice that now that you say that, a common thread uh, of the people who've been abused and exploited is that their families were not in close contact with them. Those are the ones who are the most vulnerable for this type of exploitation. They, their families just can't talk to them. And, and oftentimes, it's the illness that causes that disconnect from the family. I don't blame the family if grandpa is mean and, and ugly and rude and, and, and tells you to leave every time he comes over and accuses you of stealing things. Of course, you're not going to want to go anymore, right? Absolutely. But then somebody might come in there and just start, start taking advantage. So I guess the disconnection from family is the one weave uh, a thread that weaves through these cases and that's why i always stress to them you know although i know it's hard it's so hard i know when your parent gets ill and you don't want to get involved and, and you feel horrible because they kind of mistreat you but they're not feeling well they don't really know what they're doing i try to tell the children who say well my dad accused me of this and i don't want to go and i well you're not talking to your father you're talking to your father's illness and, and a lot of times people don't understand that when they have this argument over and over and over with a parent, it's the, their parent is no longer there. The illness is taking over. And they don't know exactly what the illness is about. Um, everybody automatically wants to label it Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Sometimes it, it's all the dementia that we just talked about, dementia. Mm -hmm. And so those are two different things. And so I always tell, I used to tell families, Talk to the doctor. Have them explain to you exactly what it is that's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, because, again, knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And the more you know, the more you can help your parent. That's right. And so uh, how many people are out there right now in El Paso? Do you have a, a number in terms of how many elderly? Um, you know what? I really don't because 10,000 a day, think about it. Right. So it's growing by leaps and bounds. Right. By leaps and and El Paso is uh, a place of retirement for, for many in our military. Many, many vets do come back. Many vets decide to stay, and so it's a place to be, and, and El Paso is growing by leaps, leaps and bounds, believe it or not. And so what are some of the other uh, 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 self-neglect issues? Self-neglect, again, it's one of the most common types of cases that we do get, and again, it's we get to the point where we can't care for ourselves appropriately, and again, there's no family involved. Mm -hmm. And so that's when those cases come in, and we do get cases like that. Um, we d I had a husband and wife. And I'm going to tell you, he was doing everything he could to take care of her, but he was ill. He got pneumonia, went to Boma, he was a vet, and they wanted to hospitalize him. He's elderly, and he says, I can't, I can't, I can't, um, because if I do, um, my wife's better in at home. And so that was a flag for the hospital, and so they said, okay, we'll send you home to take care of your wife, but we're going to send a doctor or a nurse to check on you and intravenously give you antibiotics. And so they worked with him. 
But when the nurse got there at the home and realized how bad the situation was, um, we got involved. Mm -hmm. And um, she had severe dementia. Uh, she regressed to being German, so she no longer spoke English. She was bedridden. There was a can by the bed where she had to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I don't know how hubby moved her from the bed to use the potty mm -hmm. because he was frail. Mm -hmm. um, I went ahead and tried to get them the help that they needed. She, this was one of my cases. I tried to get them the help they needed, and um, she didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, I had to do the court order thing, which is really hard to do. Yes. Emotionally, mm -hmm. it's really hard on both ends, yes. on the investigator and on the patient. She went to the hospital, and when we were at the hospital, the nurse looks at me and says, how long has she had cancer? And I said, what? I had no clue. Wow. She had breast cancer, <laughs> the end stages, and never got help. And, and the husband told me she never wanted help. And so I was able to get her to a nursing home and get her the help she needed, but she didn't last. And um, that was one of the hard cases because maybe we could have had her live a little bit longer with her and her husband together, but they never reported. It's really hard to do when you get to that point. It's so at that point, it's just such a crisis. And I think that that um, I, I've had uh, so many spouses to, in my office who are being investigated for, by APS because their spouse was at home and got out and got hit by a car or hurt. And 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 the, the spouse is saying, "Well, I'm just trying to keep my husband at home. I thought I was doing the right thing. I was always told that I'm a spouse, so I keep my husband at home." Well, but at some point. Keeping him at home is hurting you, mm -hmm. and that's caregiver and burnout. And hurting that person. Caregiver burnout is very, very common as well. And I, I, that's one thing that a lot of people don't understand. Although we're investigating you, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Uh, because we could validate, but we also could say valid, no fault. You were ill as well. You're elderly. You were doing the best you can. Yeah. We weren't trying to hurt you. We're just trying to figure out what we can do to help out. Well, I'm so grateful, Grace, that you would come and talk to us, and, and you are such a, a, a beautiful light in this community. I've known you for so many years. We worked together back when you were a caseworker, even, and uh, so you've done so much in this area, I, and I really appreciate that because so many people are afraid of APS. So many people think that it's this horrible government uh, entity that they can't even possibly understand. And you put a beautiful face on it. You know, you're a, nice, a beautiful, kind, easy person to talk to, and I think that helps because every, it helps to know that that this is what you will talk to. You know, professionals like Grace will be answering the phone and being compassionate, and you're not just this jackbooted thud kind of agency that so many people are afraid of. Actually, we've gone through so much. We did go through reform many, many, many years ago to fix things up and make things better. And I think that's what we've done. We've tried to shed light and let everybody know we're here to help. Thank you so much. Grace Ortiz with Adult Protective Services. And thank you for watching El Paso's Elder Care Channel. We'll see you again soon.